Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Mark Plattner, the editor of the Journal of Del Democracy, and it's my very great pleasure to welcome you to this afternoon's event. One big question has really been preoccupying analysts of democracy over the past several years. Namely, why has liberal democracy, after making extraordinary advances during the last quarter of the 20th century, entered a period of seeming decline, while authoritarianism, by contrast, has been experiencing an unexpected resurgence? In January of 2015, the Journal of Democracy focused its 25th anniversary issue on the question of whether democracy was, in fact, in decline. And most of our contributors, even at that early date, argued in the affirmative. And in the following four issues of the journal, we published a series of essays on the authoritarian resurgence, which were later gathered into a book entitled Authoritarianism Goes Global. When these articles were first published, they were considered quite controversial and even excessively alarmist. Three short years later, however, it's come to be widely agreed that liberal democracy is indeed in peril. That's largely because it now seems to be under assault, not only in other parts of the world, but also in the West itself. Today, it's no longer unthinkable that liberal democracy could become deconsolidated, to use a term introduced by one of our speakers today, and even erode in countries where it has been most deeply entrenched. My feeling is that we still don't have a really good grasp of why things have changed so suddenly. The most common label used to describe the current threat is populism. Scholars, of course, disagree about exactly what that term means, but it's generally agreed to combine support for the democratic principle of majority rule with hostility to the limits that liberalism places on the power of the majority. So the populist upsurge has prompted new attention to the relationship between the liberal and the democratic components of liberal democracy. These kinds of very fundamental questions are at the heart of two compelling articles, one by Bill Galston and one by Yasha Monk, that are featured in the forthcoming April 2018 issue of the Journal of Democracy. Official publication of this issue is still about two weeks away, but you can find advanced copies of both articles on the JOD website, which is www.journalofdemocracy.org. These two articles are grouped together on the cover of the April issue under the heading Populism, Liberalism, Democracy. But they had separate origins, for each of the authors has been working on a book about these matters for publication this spring. Months, The People Versus Democracy, Why Our Freedom is in Danger and How to Save It, was published by Harvard University Press on March 5th and Galston's Anti-Pluralism, The Populist Threat to Liberal Democracy, was published by Yale University Press on March 20th. So both these books, like the articles drawn, for them, drawn from them, are still hot off the press. And at the conclusion of this event, copies of both books will be available for sale in the back of the room. Here are the two books, Bill Galston's Anti-Pluralism, and Yasha Monk's The People Versus Democracy. It's perhaps worth noting that our two speakers today were both trained in political theory. So it's not surprising that their efforts to address the current problems we face rest on a conceptual analysis of the nature of liberal democracy. But each of them is also a well-known participant in policy debates and a prolific writer of op-eds and articles. They're both wonderfully clear and accessible writers, which makes them a pleasure to edit. William A. Galston is a senior fellow at the Brookings Institution, where he holds the Ezra K. Zilker Chair, a former advisor to President Clinton and to several presidential candidates. He's also a weekly columnist for the Wall Street Journal. 
He's the author of eight books and more than 100 articles in the fields of political theory, public policy, and American politics. Last year, he delivered the Seymour Martin Lipset Lecture on Democracy in the World, uh, and his current essay is an edited version uh, of the talk he gave then. Yasha Monk is a lecturer on political theory at Harvard University's government department and a senior fellow at New America's Political Reform Program. He co-authored with Roberto Stefan Foa two widely discussed Journal of Democracy articles on democratic deconsolidation, and he's published numerous articles in leading newspapers and magazines, both in the United States and in Europe. Now, at the outset today, we're going to give each of our authors 15 minutes to highlight some of the key elements of his article and his book. And when both have finished their presentations, I'll engage them in discussion for another 20 minutes or so, which should leave us ample time for questions from the floor. But we really do need to end promptly at 1.45, as each of our speakers has a plane to catch, going off to flog his book in a distant city. So those of you on Twitter can follow this presentation and contribute to the conversation by using the hashtag NED events or by following the forum at Think Democracy and the endowment at NE Democracy. Now, please join me in silencing your cell phones while I turn the floor over to Yasha Monk. Yasha. Thank you. Um, so, w when I was um, growing up, my parents who grew up in socialist Poland would tell these jokes, political jokes, around the kitchen table. And I mostly didn't understand them and couldn't really relate to them, in part because I didn't know various sort of obscure political figures that they were referencing in Poland of the 60s and 70s, uh, in part because I didn't quite relate to the sort of sense of political powerlessness. Uh, but I've been thinking of some of those jokes over the last couple of years, and in particular one which I want to share, which is relatively straightforward. Uh, a man walks home late at night um, from, from his job in a factory, and once he's nearly at home, he sees a man uh, off to the left, visibly completely drunk, throwing up over the gutter. And as soon as he sees him, he, he goes up to him, he puts his hand on his shoulder, and he says, I completely agree with your political analysis, comrade. <laughs> <laughs> You can see why I might have been feeling like that for the last few years. Uh, <laughs> we really are in a moment, uh, as, as Mark has laid out, of quite fundamental transition. When I grew up, and I think that's true of many people in this room, we assumed, we, we knew that democracy was embattled in many parts of the world, in parts of the world which were not very affluent, where democracy did not have a long history. We knew that there were some authoritarian regimes that were pretty dogged that might continue to have real influence in the world, and real pernicious influence in the world for a long time to come. But we also thought that there was a set of consolidated democracies, a set of countries which had changed government for free and fair elections a bunch of times, which were relatively affluent, more than about $14,000 uh, in today's terms, uh, GDP per capita, where democracy was safe, where we didn't have to worry about the future of democracy. Democracy was consolidated, it was the only game in town. Well, in those articles with Roberto Foa and the Journal of Democracy, we started to challenge that idea a couple of years ago, arguing that democracy is no longer the only game in town, because it's no longer true that most citizens give overwhelming support to democracy, that most citizens roundly reject authoritarian alternatives to democracy, or indeed that there are no politicians and political movements in our political systems that reject basic norms and rules of liberal democracy and yet have real power. Just to give you a couple of headlines of those findings, uh, among older Americans born in the 1930s and 1940s, over two-thirds say that it's absolutely essential to live in a democracy. Among young Americans born since 1980, less than one-third do. Twenty years ago, about one in 16 Americans said that army rule was a good system of government. Now it's one in six. And you see similar developments in other parts of the world. There's some new data from last year which shows a real increase in the number of Europeans who believe that a strong leader who doesn't have to bother with parliament and elections is a good thing. In Germany, there was 16% 20 years ago. Last year, it was 
in France, the United Kingdom, it was once upon a time 25%, now it's 50%. One in two Frenchmen and Brits who long for a strong leader who doesn't have to bother with parliament and elections. Now, there's a big debate about how to interpret that data, and I think there's some reason to be skeptical about what those kinds of opinion polls can really tell us. But of course, we've also seen radical changes in the voting behavior of citizens in North America and Western Europe, and radical changes in the behavior of both some of the new parties that have swept onto the scene and some of the more long-established ones. In the year 2000, the average vote share for populist parties in Europe was 8%, now it's 25%. If you remember Winston Churchill's Iron Curtain speech, with an Iron Curtain coming down from Staten in the north of Central Europe all the way down to the south, you can now actually drive along that Iron Curtain. You can drive from Staten in the Baltic Sea all of the way down to the Aegean, even further south than Churchill was talking about, and never leave a country ruled by populists. So populism is no longer a niche phenomenon, it has actually become dominant in one big part of Europe and it's making huge inroads in Western Europe as we've seen most recently in the Italian elections. So what I argue in my book, The People versus Democracy, is that we can only understand that by remembering that our political system is a liberal democracy, which has nothing to do with liberal and conservative, it's nothing to do with Barack Obama versus George W. Bush, it means that first of all, our political system is supposed to grant us individual liberty. That a liberal political entity is one that respects the rule of law and the separation of powers and individual rights. So that each of us can decide what to say or not say, how to worship or not worship, who to be in a relationship with or not be in a relationship with, and all of those kinds of freedoms. The second element is the democratic element. Well, democracy means the rule of the demos, the rule of the people, and I think to be democratic, a country at least has to translate popular views into public policies to a substantial degree. And the argument I make in, in the people versus democracy is that these two parts of our political system have increasingly started to come apart. But on the one side, you have the rights of a system that I would call rights without democracy, undemocratic liberalism, a political system in which the rule of law is respected and the separation of powers is uh, defining of a system in which individual rights are mostly adhered to, but in which the mechanism for translating popular views into public policies has become weaker and weaker over time. There's a number of reasons for that. The first being that a lot of legislatures aren't terribly responsive to the people they're supposed to represent. You have a huge increase in the role of money in politics, particularly uh, uh, clear in the United States, but also very strong in parts of Europe. You have a revolving door between lobbyists and legislators. You have a political class that has often lost touch with ordinary voters. And when you take all of these things together, it's not a surprise that, according to some political science studies, the views of average Americans don't actually have much impact on what happens in Congress. That bit is easy to solve in principle. It's difficult to make that change happen. It's difficult to actually reform campaign finance, but it's easy to think about what it would look like. Normatively, it's straightforward. We know what a better system would look like. There's also a set of developments, though, that are normatively more complex, where it's harder to think about how to solve it. Because it's not just that legislatures, it's not just that Congress no longer transmits popular views into public policy, it's also that lots of areas of policy have been taken out of democratic contestation altogether. You have a growing role of central banks who make more and more important decisions and are increasingly independent. You have the rise of independent uh, bureaucratic agencies, whether it's the European Commission and the European Union, or whether it is things like the Environmental Protection Agency or the Consumer Protection Bureau in the United States. You have a rise of trade treaties and international organizations. And once you take all of those things together, a lot of decisions are taken by experts and technocrats. Now, the easy solution to that is to say, let's abolish all of those things. They're all just a conspiracy to take power away from the people. We don't need them. But that's not true. In order to make sure that power plants continue to be safe, you need experts to regulate them 
and make decisions about them. And in order to respond to big challenges like climate change, you will need to coordinate the action of hundreds of states around the world. So I'm in favor of a lot of these institutions, but I think we also have to think much more seriously about the ways in which it's difficult for us here on stage or for you in the audience to feel like we have a real say in what happens when 200 countries around the world come together and decide what to do about climate change. So how do we deal with this technocratic dilemma? That's the um, topic of one part of the book, The People vs. Democracy, and this new article in the, in the Journal of Democracy as well. Now, in part as a response to this political system, we've had the rise of something that is in many ways even scarier, and that I would call democracy without rights or illiberal democracy. And it's spearheaded by populists. This is one of many things that Bill Gorse and I have in common. We think about populism, and there are some people who reject that term. So let me take a few moments to talk about what exactly a populist is. Why is it that all of these different figures are called populists, whether it's a president of Turkey, the prime minister of Hungary, the prime minister of India, some of the political figures that are now very influential in Western Europe, like Marine Le Pen or the Alternative for Germany, even some people you might think of closer to the United States. <laughs> <laughs> Why do we call them populists? Well, they don't have a lot of things in common at first sight. You may have mentioned that, you may have noticed that um, the President of the United States doesn't appear to be overly fond of Muslims. Uh, the President of Turkey doesn't appear to be overly fond of anybody who isn't a Muslim. Uh, there are some populists who are proudly right-wing economically and want to cut down on the welfare state and slash regulations on businesses. There are others who are very left-wing economically and say, no, we need to actually control business and expand the welfare state. So we don't have that in common. What do they have in common? Well, what they have in common is a way of thinking about politics that says the only reason why we have political problems is that the political elite is corrupt and self-serving. They don't really care about people like you. And so we can solve all of the problems very simply. You just have to give me power, trust me, and I'm going to fix everything. It is what Jan van der Müller calls a claim to the exclusive representation of the people. That I and only I stand for the people, which both means that I get to speak to for everybody and that anybody who disagrees with me is by that nature illegitimate. Now what happens when figures like that get into power? Unfortunately, we now have lots of examples of that. Well, first of all, they're not able to deliver on their promises. So they start saying things like, who knew that things could be so complicated? <laughs> but secondly, they start to blame because they don't want to admit that perhaps they've overpromised. And so they start to say, well, you know what's the problem? The problem is all of these independent media outlets who are terrorists at Recep Erdogan cause them are spreading fake news, as some others might say. The problem is that the other political parties aren't loyal to this country. They are traitors. The problem is that independent institutions, like the judiciary, like electoral commissions, they're enemies of the people. And so what you have is the rise of a system that is in certain ways democratic, in that it often speaks for a lot of the people in the country, in that in particular it often passes legislation against unpopular minorities, but does actually have broad support, but that also undermines the core elements of a liberal political system that we need to sustain our democracies. It starts to undermine the rule of law, the separation of powers. And this Sunday we will see what that means in Hungary where a man who is popularly elected and remains quite popular in the country is running for re-election after having turned state media into propaganda outlets, managed to force the sale of most private media companies into the hands of his allies or force them to register as lobbyists or foreign agents, has taken such control over the electoral commission that all of the opposition parties were fined a huge sum of money which makes it difficult for them to campaign while the ruling party Fidesz miraculously was never investigated. So we will now in the heart of the European Union in a country that was considered consolidated by most political scientists five years ago have elections that are neither free nor fair. 
And we already know that Western leaders are going to congratulate Viktor Orban the, the day after on his resounding election victory, without irony. And we know that Angela Merkel, the Chancellor of Germany, is still tolerating Fidesz, his party, as her sister party in the European People's Party, in the European Parliament, where the ruling German Christian Democratic Union is actually allied with the party of an authoritarian strongman. So we have to ask ourselves how all of this happened. How could this come about? And I'm sure we'll have more of a conversation about that going forward in the next hour. But I just want to outline very straight shortly how to think about that. Well, it's not enough to look at one country. When this thing is happening in so many different countries at the same time, you have to ask about what the similarities in all of these cases are. And it seems to me that there's at least three. There's a stagnation of living standards for average citizens in many countries, or a failure to deliver on the promise of catching up with the quality of life in Western Europe and North America. So in the United States, for example, from 1945 to 1960, the living standard of the average American doubled. From 1960 to 1985, it doubled again. And since 1985, it's been flat. That changes how people think about politics. Look, Americans never thought that the sorts of people who gather in a nice building in the center of Washington, D.C. are paragons of moral virtue or that they should completely be trusted. But they used to say, I'm doing twice as well as my parents did and my kids are going to do twice as well as me. So let's give them the benefit of a doubt. Now they say, I've worked really hard all my life and I don't have much to show for it. My kids are going to be worse off than me. So let's try something new. How bad could things get? And you see very strongly not that the rich necessarily vote for establishment parties and the poor necessarily vote for populists, but there is a very strong geographic pattern where parts of a country that are less affluent, that have had less recent economic investment, where there is uh, a higher share of jobs that might be automated away, are much more likely to vote for populists. This is true across North America and Western Europe and beyond. The second important thing is a set of cultural challenges. Most, democracy most democracies were founded as mono-ethnic and monocultural countries. In Italy, in Germany, in Sweden in 1960, it would have seemed very obvious to people who really belongs. It was somebody who was ethnically descended from Italian or German or Swedish stock. Thankfully, that has started to change over the last 50 years. People have started to accept that they can have compatriots who are brown or black, who are Muslim or Hindu or for that matter Jewish. But there's a strong rebellion against that as well and in a way that shouldn't surprise us because people got something out of being part of a majority group. If you weren't the most affluent guy, you weren't the most educated guy, you perhaps weren't the guy who gets the most social respect in your society, it was very tempting to say, well at least I'm Italian rather than a foreigner or at least I'm part of a majority rather than an immigrant. Well, that's thankfully being challenged. That immigrant might now be your boss. That immigrant might now be representing you in parliament. And we should celebrate that, but it shouldn't surprise us that there's resistance against it. The story in the United States on that count is both similar and different. It's different in that the United States has always obviously been a multi-ethnic society, but it's similar in that it's always been a multi-ethnic society with a strict racial hierarchy in which one group had big advantages over others. We should pause to remember how far we've come in overcoming that. There's no doubt in my mind that it's better today to be a member of an ethnic, a religious or a sexual minority than it was 20 or 40 or 60 years ago. There's obviously still big injustices, but we have also challenged people's privileges in an important way. And again, it shouldn't surprise us that some people feel like they've had something taken away from them. It's been rightly taken away from them, but it's true that something's been taken away from them. So the third thing is the rise of social media and the internet. If you already have a basic lack of trust in the political system because people don't feel like life is getting better economically, if you already have fears about uh, a change in the nature of your political and lived community, then the internet allows people to act on that frustration much more strongly. Now, as um, the Journal of Democracy has long argued, there are some 
very empowering parts of social media. It often allows people who have wrongly been excluded from public discourse to have a real voice. But it also makes it easy for people who have hateful views, for people who want to spread propaganda or lies, to have a real voice in our political system. And coming on top of the other two elements, that's a very dangerous cocktail. In the book, I also say a lot about what we can actually do to stand up for our freedoms. And I'm happy to say more about that in the q and I, I don't want to take too much time. But just to outline very broadly, we need to show people that the political system is responsive to them, and that does mean limiting the role of money in politics. We need to show people that we can stand for globalization and stand for free trade and stand for all of the great benefits this has brought both to the United States and to other countries around the world, but also show that it's possible to make sure that rich individuals and corporations pay their fair share of tax, that it's possible to have all of those things and actually promise real gains of living standards for average citizens, that it's possible in the words of the Brexiteers, the people who wanted the United Kingdom to leave the European Union, to take back control, for individuals to feel like I'm in control of my life and my nation is in control of its fate, even as we preserve some of the basic institutions of a liberal international order. The second thing is that we need to fight for an inclusive sense of nationalism and of patriotism. But rather than either accepting the exclusive nationalism, the white nationalism of parts of the right, or going all the way to the other end and saying, if nationalism is so dangerous, let's get rid of it entirely, let's throw it out of a window, I think we should proudly stand up for a notion of nationalism that says, yes, there's something special about a national community in which if something happens to people in Houston, I feel like I should have solidarity with them. And by the way, if something happens to people in Puerto Rico, they too are my compatriots, and I should help them get over a terrifying storm. But that has to be an inclusive notion. It has to be a notion in which we emphasize what unites rather than divides us as Americans, or for that matter for people in Europe as Germans or Italians or Swedes, across racial and ethnic lines. And the third thing I want to say is our response to social media, where the temptation now is to censor. And I get the temptation, because there's many views that I don't think have a place in public discourse. But there's no institution whom I trust to determine what those views are. And that's always been the best argument for free speech, and that argument retains fidelity in the age of social media as well. So what should we do? We should fight for our values in a much more proactive way. As Bill Goldstein has shown, the number of hours that high schools spend teaching civics has plummeted in the past decades. As anybody who teaches in an American university knows, we spend a lot of time pointing out the flaws of our political system, but very little time actually talking about what's good in our political system. Now there's lots of things that is wrong, and we should be upfront about those, and we should think with our students about how to overcome that. But we also need to remind people that liberal democracy offers something very special and very unique. That it is better today to be a citizen of the United States or of Germany or of Sweden than it is to be a citizen of Turkey or Russia or Venezuela. From Plato to Aristotle and from Rousseau to the Founding Fathers, each generation of thinkers who thought about how to sustain a self-governing republic emphasized the importance of passing down our values from one generation to the next. <coughs> We've paid lip service to that over the past decades, but we haven't taken it seriously. Well, at this time at which our, our freedom is in danger, in which our democracies are at stake, it's high time that we start to fight for the survival of our democratic institutions and the survival of our political values. Thanks. <coughs> <laughs> Thank you, Yasha. And now we'll turn to Bill Galston. Well, let me begin by expressing my appreciation to the National Endowment for Democracy for convening this event. Uh, I remember Yogi Berra Day at, Thank you, at Yankee Stadium. You know, Yogi rose and in his inimitable fashion thanked all of the people who had made this day necessary. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and if I think about the people who made this day necessary. I'm not sure that I should be thanking them, but they know who <laughs> they are. Uh, and I also, you know, I also want to salute 
the Journal of Democracy for the extraordinary intellectual leadership that it has displayed in not only giving ample space to the, you know, to the discussion of these issues, but as you pointed out in your, in your introduction, Mark, by taking the lead, even when doing so was quite controversial because she really opened up a space for the discussion uh, the, of which today's panel is, is an example. Uh, you know, Yasha said so many things with which I agree completely that I can sort of just check them off my presentation. Uh, and and Th that's why I bribed Mark to go first. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I would also point out that that uh, Yasha's book is twice as long as mine, which means if you're interested in value for dollar, <laughs> <laughs> there is <laughs> there's only one book to buy. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm surprised that Harvard's publicist hasn't made that point more <laughs> explicitly. <laughs> but I, you know, well, let me just say very briefly that uh, you know we're having this discussion because, along with the rise of China, the rise of populism in the West is arguably the most important political phenomenon of the 21st century so far. Uh, this was a sort of a niche subject while it was slowly developing. Uh, I think it became quite topical in, in, in Europe a decade ago, but it wasn't until the Brexit vote and then, of course, the, the 2016 presidential election that it really became a central topic of concern uh, to, to many, many Americans. Uh, there was a brief moment of hope last summer, you know, after you know, Emmanuel Macron's magical victory, you know, not only a personal victory, but it's as though he conjured a political party out of thin air and turned it into the legislative majority. There was a sense that, well, we'd reached a turning point, populism had peaked, that the center was resurging, etc. Well, that was then. Since then, we've seen the rise of the AFD in Germany, uh, the entrance of a right-wing popula uh, populist party into Austria's ruling coalition, two consecutive populist victories, you know, parliamentary and then presidential in the Czech Republic. Of course, the astonishing, the astonishing turn of events in Italy just a few weeks ago. Uh, we have seen uh, in recent weeks Poland's Holocaust law, uh, and even more recently, uh, Viktor Orban's decision. Uh, to make his presidential re-election campaign a referendum on George Soros, who is being depicted and described in terms that are uncannily reminiscent of the bad old days of the 1930s and 1940s. And we are seeing, you know, uh, parallel with these events, uh, the collapse of the center-left throughout Europe, uh, the socialists who elected a president in 2012 got 7% of the vote in the presidential election five years later. Astonishing. And what I will call the co-optation of the, central, the center right. Many center right parties are making their peace with some of the worst elements of populism in order to try to placate restive, restive voters. Uh, I think during the Cold War, liberal Democrats got accustomed to communism as the enemy without. Well, populism is the enemy within because, as Yasha rightly said, you know, it, you know, it offers a critique of the status quo in the name of democracy itself, which makes it a particularly perplexing and elusive target because the populists ex accept two pillars of liberal democracy, the idea of the sovereignty of the people, that all legitimate power flows from the people, and the idea that if, if, citizens are, if citizens are equal, at least in their civic capacity, their votes ought to count equally, and therefore there is a default setting in favor of the right of the majority to get its way. But Populists are uncomfortable with two other defining elements of liberal democracy. Constitutionalism as a set of entrenched institutions and procedures that enjoy a special durability and uh, 
and create the framework within which ordinary decision making occurs. And they are especially skeptical about and impatient of the anti-majoritarian institutions and principles that protect the rights of individuals, of unpopular minorities, and the institutions that are necessary in order to make those, you know, the, those uh, protections more than parchment guarantees, namely independent courts, including independent constitutional courts. So that from the standpoint of a formal political theoretical analysis is why populism is the enemy within. Uh, but there are also some substantive or, if you will, sociological characteristics that typically attend populist parties and governments. First of all, a homogeneous understanding of the real people. Uh, secondly, the idea that the people are not only homogeneous but virtuous. Uh, and as such, they stand opposed to the enemies of the people. And third is a particular form or style of governments, governance that I will call political disintermediation. That is to say, a direct relationship, a felt emotional relationship between the people on the one hand and a charismatic leader, almost always a male charismatic leader. And one could do a very interesting analysis if there were time of the, of the gender component of, of the rise of populism. So far, I think Yasha and I are in complete agreement. I have a somewhat, I have a parallel but somewhat different in emphasis analysis of the causes of the rise of populism. Uh, but in good Hegelian fashion, and Yasha has blazed the trail here, I will, you know, I will introduce three causes. <laughs> uh, the first of which is economics. And here we have a very deep structural problem that all the advanced economies are wrestling with. That problem is not just the decline of traditional manufacturing, but it is the rise of the knowledge and innovation economy that has very important consequences, not just for class, but also for place. Uh, as the Berkeley economist Enrico Moretti has argued, uh, there is a new geography of jobs and growth because the knowledge economy exists in large, diverse metropolitan areas where you have people, uh, highly educated people, innovators who are bouncing ideas off each other. Over the past decade, more and more of the growth in economies as a whole has become located in large, diverse metropolitan areas for the most part, the hinterlands, the small towns and rural areas have been left farther and farther behind. And so this is not something you can read off the income distribution tables. It's not Thomas Piketty's analysis. But in a system of geographical representation, it has profound political consequences. Because if certain places are doing well and other places are doing badly, and that is a structural fact for which there is no immediate remedy in sight. That creates a split, a new version of the old split between the city and the countryside. And you can see I in Western Europe, in the UK, and in the United States, the home of populism is not in the cities. It's in the countryside and the small towns. And the new economy is the reason why. Second, you know, second category of causes government, uh, which takes two forms, one characteristic of the United States, which is partisan polarization, gridlock, and the incapacity to act. Uh, and in Europe, it's more like a center-left, center-right duopoly that had the effect of excluding certain sorts of issues from the core of the political agenda and debate altogether. In the United States, gridlock and the incapacity to act has fed the rise of populism because people are looking for effective governance and they're not too particular about the means. So I, uh, one of the things that I do at Brookings is survey research and so I, I help to formulate and conduct a survey in the spring of 2016, an interesting time in our nation's history. And we, you know, our team 
put the following proposition to the American people, agree or disagree, quote, because things in the country have gone so far off track, the United States needs a leader willing to break some rules to set things right. 45% of the electorate agreed with that proposition. 41% of Democrats, interesting, interestingly, 49% of Republicans, 53% of the white working class, and fully 65% of Trump supporters. So that sense that the system wasn't working and you needed to break it the way a chick needs to peck its way out of a shell, you know, in order, in, in order to breathe, is very much with us. The third category is culture. And you know, and the sense that is widespread in many quarters, a sense of cultural displacement. For quite some time that has taken the form of people who have traditional values rooted often in religion and cultures that have sustained themselves over a great uh, long period of time, that those traditional values and religiously based understandings are under assault from progressive elites. Uh, and part of the assault takes the form of law, but the other part of the assault takes the form of disrespect or even contempt for people who haven't gone with the progressive flow of ever more inclusive uh, and generous and kind values. Uh, but the tip of the spear of this fear of cultural displacement in recent years has been immigration. Uh, Immigration was the core issue that drove the Brexit vote. It was the decisive issue in putting Donald Trump over the top. And it has dominated the rise of European populism ever since Angela Merkel's honorable but politically disastrous decision to open Germany's doors to more than a million refugees. Uh, that was the decision that helped to elevate Mr. Orban uh, to the leadership of the populist you know, counter-revolution in, in Europe. And I could go through each one of the European populist parties and demonstrate in detail how it has been energized or re-energized uh, by public antipathy to, to immigration, particularly the recent, recent flow of immigrants and refugees from the, uh, you know, from the Middle East and North Africa. Uh, in, the, in the 15 months preceding the, the, uh, the recent Italian elections, 690,000 immigrants and refugees arrived in Italy. You can multiply that figure by about four and a half to see what it means in American terms. Imagine if we were wrestling with two and a half or three million refugees when we are struggling to come to agreement on how to deal with tens of thousands. We're talking about two orders of magnitude more. So, what do we do about all of this? Uh, well, three problems, three solutions. <laughs> the canonical number. Uh, when it comes to economics, the most urgent task is the geographical reintegration of neglected regions into full membership in the American economy and society. In the 1930s, the Franklin Roosevelt and the New Deal embarked on a program of rural electrification. And the idea was to bring electricity to every small town and every hamlet and every holler, as they say in West Virginia, uh, in the country. The point was in part economic, but it was in part social, cultural, and even political. It was to connect disconnected parts of America and make them part of one society and one economy. And over time, it was a success. The challenge in our day is very much the same. Uh, electricity was at the core of the 20th century economy. Information is at the core of the 21st century economy. So a 21st century program of geographical reintegration would begin with rural broadband and build out from there in 
in the direction of the reconstruction of meaningful economic link links between metropolitan areas on the one hand and hinterlands on the other. Uh, in, govern in, in government, if ineffectiveness and gridlock is the challenge, at least in the United States, well, we need institutional reforms that will at least mute the effects of polarization and restore the capacity of the government to act. Uh, and we also need action on the political level to try to lower the temperature and to create venues within which people of goodwill across the partisan and ideological spectrum can convene and de-demonize each other and begin to work together. And I have some examples of that, some of which I've participated in that I'd be happy to talk about during the question and answer period. Third, with regard to culture, uh, again, two recommendations. We need a new culture of respect in the United States. One of my first recommendations uh, to my fellow party members was to, ban to banish the phrase flyover country from our vocabulary and then to move out from there. People who disagree with us are sometimes disagreeable, but they should never be regarded as deplorable. Uh, second, and this is tougher, and I'll be happy to go into detail, the immigration issue is doing more than any other single issue to poison the tone and substance of politics in the United States and not just in the United States. We need to find a fair and honorable way of putting this controversy behind us. I've spent 10 years thinking about this. I'd be happy to talk about how in the question and answer period. But as long as that issue is hanging out there, it is going to be very, very difficult uh, to take the emotional steam out of the populist revolt. Finally, I want to end on an optimistic note. Uh, liberal democracy is certainly threatened in the new democracies of post-communist Europe. Uh, it is certainly challenged in some of the more established democracies. I do not believe that the threat is as yet existential in the United States, and uh, I don't expect it to become so, first of all, because our institutions, I think, are enduring a stress test, and I think they're passing it and I expect them to continue passing it. But second, because if anything, I detect signs that public opinion is turning back in favor of liberal democracy in the United States. I belong to an outfit, a bipartisan outfit called the Voter Study Group, and the most recent publication of the Voti Voter Studies Group was co-authored by, among other people, uh, Larry Diamond, long associated with the National Endowment for Democracy. And this study of recent survey results found that since just 2014, the share of Americans who say that it is very important to live in a democracy has increased from 73 to 83 percent. Fully 78 percent say that democracy is pre preferable to any other kind of government in all circumstances and support for a strong leader who doesn't have to bother with Congress and elections has fallen sharply. Only a minority of those who don't think that democracy is a particularly good form of government are willing to endorse authoritarian alternatives. Are there problems? Yes. Uh, but I think that Americans are a long way from losing faith in their governing institutions and principles, even though that faith has been sorely tried in the past two decades. Thank you very much. <laughs> well, thanks to both of you for really excellent uh, presentations. And before opening it to the floor, I thought we might uh, take a few minutes to try to encourage a discussion among the two of you. In looking through the two books, uh, I have to say that I found very little daylight between you on most of the major issues that, uh, uh, that you discussed. 
And uh, so I want to give either of you an opportunity, if you have some disagreement with what the other has said. And first let me ask that in a general way, and then I'll uh, have a few specifics if there's nothing that comes to your mind. I, I suppose we have to say something now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I think we do mostly agree. Um, I, I would say that the challenge that Bill has framed around immigration is broader than that. I agree that uh, the rise of immigration as a political issue has a lot to do with a sense of a loss of control. And I think it's important there to distinguish between the extent to which we need to make people feel like this is a controlled process that is a result of democratic decisions that are taken and in which people's views are respected and what the substance of the policies are. I actually think the more people feel that the border is secure, the more people feel like they can have, they can express their opinions about immigration without being tarred as somehow beyond the political pale as a result the more they're actually going to be willing to accept, you know, reasonably open-hearted policies. Um, certainly, when you ask a question like whether more diversity is a good thing for your country, most European societies actually say no to that, but most Americans say yes to that. Not just diversity, more diversity. A majority of Americans think that's a good thing for their country. So it's not true that most Americans are racist, that most Americans are white supremacists or anything like that, as some people on the further left, I think, want to claim. That is not true. I mean, we have a pretty deep consensus about the fact that, of course, an American can be brown or black. Of course, an American can have any number of religions. But to defend that consensus, I think, uh, and that's largely a, an area of agreement, we need to make it easier to have an, an, an open debate about immigration in which we recognize that it's, it's, it's okay to have different options about that, and that should be subject to a political fight. And I might disagree with some of my compatriots about that. I might have more, uh, you know, I might have preferences for relatively more open immigration than some of my fellow citizens, but that's okay. We should be allowed to have that as a normal part of a political debate without anybody being um, tarred with a brush that's unfair as a result. Now, where I would go further than Bill though is that I do think this is reacting, or this is part of a much a, a more challenging process. But certainly outside of North America, the, there are practically no democracies that haven't been founded with this deeply mono-ethnic, monocultural conception of themselves. And it's a historically unique experiment to try and transform that self-conception into a multi-ethnic one. And we have to succeed, because ultimately the principles of liberal democracy, which have to include equal respect towards all citizens, irrespective of their ethnicity, irrespective of their religious choices, requires that. And this is going to be a difficult process against which there's tremendous resistance. And that <coughs> goes beyond recent immigration. It goes beyond the question of how many people have come in as immigrants in the last couple of days, a couple of years. In Germany, for example, the refugee crisis, which uh, uh, Bill mentioned, certainly is one of the reasons why the alternative for Germany is now the third biggest party in the country, the second biggest in some of the polls. But the party was very close to coming into parliament in the previous elections before the rise of the refugee crisis. A very nasty book by a fellow called Tilo Sarrazin, which essentially argued that uh, Turkish immigrants and their children have more offspring than quote-unquote real Germans, and they're also less intelligent, so Germany is becoming dumber over time, uh, was the best-selling book of, best-selling non-fiction book of Germany's post-war history before the start of the refugee crisis. So I wouldn't say it's a deep disagreement with Bill, but I would say it's a change of emphasis, that the challenge of building this equal multi-ethnic society is both one we cannot sidestep and is one that is of longer standing than uh, acute worries about about spikes of immigration that we see in European countries, for example. Mm. You want to respond? Well, yeah. you know, this is you know, this is such a deep and interesting issue. You know, the more I think about it, uh, but to take Yasha's framework for just a minute, historically, stable multi-ethnic 
polities were empires, not republics. Right? Whether you look at Rome or the Ottoman Empire or, of course, you know, the Habsburg Empire, the model was very much the same. You know, the authority of the empire provided a framework, sort of a container, if you will, in which different ethnicities, different nationalities, different religions, you know, could enjoy a measure of autonomy in peace and security. And we all know what happened in Europe when the, you know, when, when this imperial carapace was shattered. We are still seeing in the Middle East, you know, the, you know, the death of the Ottoman Empire has still not been fully integrated <laughs> into the politics of the Middle East. And uh, I will not go back so far, so far, uh, so far as Rome. I would say that, uh, and once again, this is a difference of, emphasi a difference of emphasis. You know, two things. You know, first of all, in Italy, the league got four percent of the vote in 2013. It got 18 percent of the vote in the most recent Italian election. After it turned away from the idea of secession and you know unification with North Tyrol. I don't know, maybe under the emperor. Um, <laughs> once it turned away from that and focused on anti, virulently anti-immigrant rhetoric, it soared. It soared past Berlusconi. Uh, its gains were more than twice the gains of the Five Star Movement. And if there is a center-right coalition governing Italy, the League will lead it, uh, in all probability. Uh, and you know the. The, the AFD, the FD in Germany, when it shifted from being a sort of a grumpy quasi-liberal party to a more ethnically based anti-immigrant party became, became supercharged. And I don't think we'd be having this conversation of the AFD were it not for the events of 2015 and the reaction to it. I grant that's not when it started, but that's when it reached real liftoff. Uh, uh, so that's one point. A second point is that that this is not mission impossible. Uh, you know, I went I went to Toronto in 2015 to uh, uh, 2015 this January to deliver the Lipset lecture for the second time, and I was struck by the fact that as I studied Canada, that one of the very big differences between Canada and the United States is that. In the past 20 years, the Canadians have moved from a situation in which their immigration system was much less popular than it was in the United States to a situation in which it's much more popular in the United States. Public support for, you know, for Canadian, Canadian immigration, which stood at one-third of the populace in 1995, is now about two-thirds. Why did that happen? Well, because they found a way, a structure for their immigration system that seemed to go, that seemed to fit with the flow of Canadian economics and Canadian culture. And that did not, that did not require reducing the number of immigrants. As a matter of fact, the flow of immigrants into Canada is three times the pace of the flow of in immigrants into the United States. But it did mean giving much more emphasis to the potential economic contribution of immigrants and much less weight than we do to family reunification as the basis of immigration. Nobody else in the world awards two-thirds two of its immigrant slots each year on the basis of family ties. And that has generated an enormous amount of economic and social tension in the United States. We can do better. We don't have to become illiberal. You know, we don't have to become nativists. We don't have to become xenophobes. We just need to get with the 21st century because the law that we're now functioning under was enacted in 1965 in very different times. So I think we're slowly inching towards disagreement. <laughs> it's we're, taking our, we're taking our time. <laughs> let, let me start with one point of agreement, but then I have two actual points of disagreement. <laughs> ah. so, so I agree with you about the special way in which multi-ethnic societies are harder in democracies. And I think that's a point that we rarely think about, but that's very important. And so I 
mention all of the empires that you mentioned, the mm -hmm. Roman Empire and the Ottoman Empire and so on in the book as well. And I just want to read a brief passage on this point, which is that it is comparatively easy for a king or an emperor to be generous in granting his subjects the equal status of citizenship. After all, in a monarchy, citizenship does not confer any actual power. It is much more difficult not for even democracy. Called citizenship. Indeed. Subject. Subjectship. Yeah, yeah. It is much more difficult for a democracy or self-governing republic to be generous in its rules for membership. After all, in a system that allows the people to rule, anybody who gains the status of citizen gets to have a say in the future of all of his compatriots. So might the fact that the Roman Empire adopted more generous rules of membership than the Roman Republic suggest that there is some kind of link between democracy and an exclusive notion of citizenship? Or to put the question in even more stark terms, does the ideal of self-government make it more difficult for a diverse set of citizens to live alongside each other as equals? I think that is a very serious question. I try to answer it in the book by, uh, by saying that, yes, it does make it more difficult in certain ways, but it's possible. We can build a multi-ethnic society, which we're proud of. We do have to set out the rules for that in a way that can gain broad agreement. And I agree with you that um, prioritizing high-skill immigration is a good way of doing it, especially in Western Europe where so much immigration has deliberately been non-high-skill. It was governments going out in the 50s and 60s looking basically for unskilled workers to come and do very simple tasks in factories. The idea of what it is to be an immigrant is often to be somebody who's low-skill and has less educational advantage and so on. I think bringing in a ton of high-skilled people to countries like Germany and Sweden would actually really help transform people's image of what an immigrant is and what he looks like. And Canada has done a good job of that. Now, either Canada hasn't done as good a job as Bill says, or immigration isn't as central to the populist reaction as he claims. Because I too have been to Toronto recently, in fact I've been there last week, <laughs> and it's the one place where I don't get a, s a, a particular question. Wherever I talk about this book, I get a question which is, but aren't there some countries that really are immune from populism where everything is wonderful? What about Canada? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't get that question in Canada. <laughs> You know why? Do you remember Rob Ford, the mayor of Toronto? Interesting figure. Became well known for a little home video in which he was smoking crack. Mm -hmm. Was in many other ways a deep populist We in Washington well. felt right at home when we watched <laughs> that video, by the way. <laughs> well, his brother, Doug Ford, is now the leader of a conservative party in Ontario, is running in many ways a classic populist campaign, and according to all of the polls, is about to be the next premier of Ontario. So in a country that has the Canadian uh, high skill favoring immigration system, uh, populists can still gain majorities, apparently. That's point number one. Point number two is, you know, we can talk about particular examples. I mentioned the alternative for Germany. You mentioned the Italian League. But when you look, uh, as I've done the study, at the rise of populist parties over time in Europe, there is no clear turning point. It's not, not a clear turning point in 2008, as some people want to say. This is all about the economic crisis. You don't see that in the data. Or some people want to say, is build it. It's all about the refugee crisis. You don't see that in the data either. It's actually, once you look at different countries and, and sort of average them, it's a surprisingly smooth line. Populism has been rising in a steady way for a very long time. And that points, I think, to the depth of a challenge. Well, I don't, you know, I, I don't think that we need to continue this colloquy on immigration any longer. I think you have, you know, you have seen both the very broad area of, uh, of agreement and around the margins some areas of disagreement. Uh, I have, you know, I have a somewhat different analysis of European developments over the past three years, but I grant that the impact of immigration has been particularly profound uh, in some European countries and it has left populism relatively untouched in others. Uh, I, think that the, I, I think that the examples of, you know, of Germany and Hungary and Italy are, are powerful, uh, but no doubt if you take a look at the Front National and average, average in a few other countries, uh, that may, you know, those effects may disappear into the arithmetic total. Uh, we can argue about whether that's exactly the right way to look at this, but I think that we've reached the point of diminishing returns on that point now. Yeah. And uh, it sounds like disappointingly, we mostly agree to agree. Well, 
Uh, I, I, I'm so sorry. <laughs> and, and to the people who are watching this on, on C-SPAN, uh, <laughs> if you came for a food fight, you've come to the wrong right. program. The <laughs> agreement is on these and related issues is, is even greater. I mean, both have written in defense of a yeah. civic or inclusive nationalism uh, recently, which is clearly connected with the uh, questions of uh, ethnicity and, and immigration. And and I think there is something striking about the fact that two uh, uh, authors coming from different backgrounds and so on do find so much mm -hmm. uh, to agree upon, uh, even if it makes for a less fiery exchange. Yeah. So let's open it up. Uh, I'll start with Carl, and then next one there. Please <laughs> identify yourself at uh, the outset. Carl Gershman, Head and Ed. Um, and thanks to, to both of you. I want to just, I think there is a difference uh, that I just want to point out, and maybe you could talk about it. I mean, and this was also true last January in 2017 when the two of you appeared on a panel. You were more optimistic, Bill, and today your statistics are more optimistic. And you might as well at least tease that out. I mean, because you're talking about the negative statistics, you're talking about the positive statistics. The second thing is that, you know, in trying to understand American pluralism and what holds us together. We've talked mostly about immigration here as and where a kind, there's a kind of a right-wing attack upon pluralism, but there's also a left-wing attack on pluralism, which is identity politics. And you're both of different generations. Bill, you have seen the rise of identity politics in the United States going back to the 1960s, which really undermined the whole idea that there was an Americanism that united us. And I, just, and I think that very likely, I'd like to hear your thoughts on this, how that might have contributed to the, uh, to the reaction against, uh, against the left in the United States. And maybe, Yasha, you can comment as somebody who is both younger, didn't grow up from the 60s, um, and also didn't grow up as an American, how you might see that and whether there's any reflection of that uh, in Europe. Well, I'll be, I'll be happy to uh, extend my optimistic remarks in two respects. Uh, first of all, let me drop a footnote to a Journal of Democracy article that was published at roughly the same time that Yasha and I started flooding your pages. Uh, and uh, as I recall, the, founding was, the finding was that even in the interwar period, when the pressure on liberal democracy was at its greatest, no established democracy fell from within. Uh, I think I'm remembering this correctly. It had been established before the First World War. Exactly. Year. It was the newer democracies, you know, and of course the poster child here is the Weimar Republic, uh, but, but you, could, you, you could extend that. Uh, and so it seems to me, if I had to make a very rough qu quantitative judgment of the intensity of pressure on liberal democracy now and in the interwar period, I would have to say that it was greater on both the ideological front and the practical political front during the interwar period. And so that historical baseline gives me some confidence. Now let me just, speaking not as a political scientist, but as an American with some knowledge of American history, this tension between our creedal principles on the one hand and changes in ethnicity and demography and the balance of our population on the other is a story that goes back before the beginning of the Republic. Uh, Benjamin Franklin has some very tart things to say about the alleged unassimilabil unassimilability of Germans who had come to Pennsylvania in the mid, you know, in the mid 18th century. They stick together. They don't. As learn somebody who grew up in Germany, I agree with him wholeheartedly. <laughs> <that. laughs> they don't, you know, they they don't learn English, et, et cetera, et cetera, and. If you look at previous spikes of immigration in the United States, the Irish in the 1840s, the Chinese when they were imported to build railroads right after the Civil War, the flood of Central and Southern Europeans that reached our shores between 1880 and 1920, each one of those generated cultural tensions and anti-immigrant ire that it took both statesmanship and time to solve. Finally, 
you know, responding in agreement to the thrust of your question about identity politics, Yasha and I were agreeing emphatically about the historical fact that you know, ethnic diversity has t typically been housed peacefully in empires, not republics, and the United States is the great experiment to the contrary. What substitutes for imperial authority in the United States is the American creed, this basket of principles and the institutions that the principles have spawned. If we don't have that in common, we don't have the framework within which these different ethnicities and religions can live in security and safety, you know, each under his fig tree and his vine with none to make him afraid, to quote George Washington's famous letter, you know, to the Turo Synagogue. Uh, and, and, as part of, and, and as part of the response to the immigration problem, I think we need not just a policy response, but a civic response. As I was celebrating Pesach this, th this weekend, I found myself wondering, what if America had a kind of a civic holiday of that sort? Let's call it the 4th of July, you know, where we had 48 pages that we all read and discussed <laughs> together. Could we agree on those 48 pages right now? 24 of your book, 24 of my book. Yeah. <laughs> 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 uh, <laughs> yes. Uh, and yours would only be half as expensive <laughs> per page. We've already <laughs> established that. Uh, so I, I, you know, I, I think, yes, to the extent that we take our multi-ethnic history and future seriously, we have to take the framework of common rules and principles seriously. We have no choice. And that means that we have to revive them because they're in not, not in good repair right now. So let me answer uh, your two questions as well. Um, uh, look, I think that, unfortunately, the what there hasn't been, th not a lot of work has been done going back about people's support for the basic democratic institutions in places like the United States because we assumed everybody was agreed on that. Mm -hmm. So it was asked every now and again as part of a World Values Survey because we asked about a million different things in a million different countries. Uh, but there isn't a very solid base to go off going back decades. There's a lot more very recent research, and the data points are a little bit all over the place. There are some seeming pieces of good news. So, for example, it does seem to be the case at the moment that young Americans associate the idea of a strong leader with a particular person who shall not be named, <laughs> and mm -hmm. that since that person is not very popular among the young, they have actually started to reject the idea of a strong ruler who doesn't have to bother with parliament and elections and higher numbers than they did. <laughs> There's also some very worrying uh, news in the new data. One of the worrying things is that it used to be that support for basic democratic rules and norms was bipartisan, as well it should be. That uh, whether somebody said that they were on the left of a political spectrum or they were on the right of a political spectrum was not a good predictor of whether they rejected authoritarian alternatives to democracy. Well, now it's starting to become increasingly partisan, where people on the right of the political spectrum are more likely to say, perhaps we need a strong leader who doesn't have to bother with Congress and elections. Perhaps we should have army rule. Perhaps our political system isn't working. So that's a very worrying trend. And the other thing I would say is that there are a lot of questions on the young on which the young do seem, even in the latest data, which is an excellent study by, um, by Larry Diamond and Lee Drutman and Joe Goldman, which everybody should check out, um, uh, on some counts, the young, they are more open to alternatives as well. They are less likely to be consistently democratic across a number of dimensions. And when you look at the degree of support for these alternatives that we see in the United States today, especially among the young, they are comparable to what they were in Venezuela in the mid-90s. So even for, yes, most people like democracy, and I agree that it's rarely the case that a majority of people say, let's get rid of democracy, they are still so upset with the political system, so cynical that it's ever going to deliver for them, that they're very open not to people, it's not the colonels marching in the streets, that's not my worry. It is people who say, this system isn't working too well, of course I'm a Democrat, of course I'm in favor of democratic institutions, 
that you know what, somebody needs to go and radically change what's happening here. Just trust me, just give me a little bit of power and I'll sort it out. That is how democracies usually go to die. And I think that is quite a bit of evidence in the public opinion data that there's a lot of people who would be tempted by that, including some of the people who have not yet been mobilized. When you look in other countries, there's a lot of young people who are open to authoritarian alternatives to democracy. I don't think there has yet been a successful populist candidate in the United States who has made that the main demographic they are trying to mobilize. Once we get that, I'm quite worried that it's going to be pretty powerful. Now, speaking to the second question, you know, I don't much like the word identity politics because I think that so many things are subsumed under it and that people on different sides of the political spectrum mean such a different thing by it that it's a recipe for talking past each other. So I want to say a couple of things. First of all, it is quite clear to me that at this point there are many members of ethnic and religious and to some degree sexual minorities that are under acute attack. And I think we should be absolutely unapologetic and not make any footnote about the fact that they deserve our support and that we need to defend them. <laughs> At the same time, I also think that there is a temptation and a risk to emphasize both the real injustices in our country and the things that separate us in a way that actually makes it harder to build coalitions where we see the things on which we agree and where we see the things on, on which we want to fight together to create a better society. So one way of relating that back to the American principles is that there's two sets of views that I reject. There's the set of view that says our American principles are absolutely right and there's never been a problem with them. All we need to do is to keep applying them in the way we have and everything is going to be fine. I think that is naive because it underestimates the degree to which the people have been excluded from enjoying those principles. To which in our history, unfortunately, all too often, there have been groups that have not gotten to enjoy the protection of those principles in the same way. So I reject that point of view. I also reject the other point of view, which is to say, you know what, if these principles have always been applied selectively, if there's been a bunch of hypocrisy in how they've operated in real life, then perhaps those principles are all wrong. Let's get rid of them. I think that is a huge mistake as well. So instead we need to recognize that yes, we have a principles that can make an equal multi-ethnic society work. We might have to fine-tune them, we might have to, you know, we might have to keep evolving in various ways, but the basic principles are there. What we have to do is to fight to make sure that everybody who lives in our country gets to enjoy those principles equally. Thank you both. Let's take a few questions now. Let's go on this side, right? In front, right? And the general behind him there. Right. Uh, thank you for a very interesting discussion uh, with lots to talk about, but uh, keeping it simple. The, the uh, I when we talk about, in, in your discussions about democracy, it's often framed as liberal democracy against authoritarianism, or as you framed it in your book, the people against democracy and implied is that it's against liberal democracy, the kind of democracy we have here. But is that really the case? Is, uh, when we talk about liberal democracy, are we championing democracy or the constraints of liberalism, the, cons the constraints of rule of law that champion or that safeguard universal human rights rather than the majoritarian democracy that ultimately may lead to authoritarianism? So in a sense, authoritarianism is an outspring, is an outgrowth uh, of, of uh, uh, majoritarian democracy, and we're championing the constraints on democracy rather than democracy itself, or should be con uh, championing those constraints. Why do we not do that? Why do we not champion, and champion the constraints as something good in and of themselves? particularly now that, uh, that uh, telecommunications, that internet, and so forth, make those constraints purely a technological limitation that we could perhaps do without, as in our discussion about the necessity of the Electoral College, or as in the discussion in Britain about uh, the, the using the popular vote for Brexit. So I'll stop there. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you.
Thank you for a very interesting uh, conversation. My name is Eddie Skolnick. I'm a law student at Georgetown University. Um, Mr. Galston, you mentioned at the outset, alongside the rise of populism, you think the rise of China is one of the most significant trends in the modern era. And Mr. Munch, you also mentioned the uh, sort of dominance of populist parties uh, alongside the former Iron Curtain. And But neither of you really frame this discussion as a, in a Cold War uh, mind. Uh, frame of mind, and I'm wondering what you think the virtues and shortcomings are of that kind of framing. I'll just point out, you know, with China offering an alternative <coughs> to the liberal democracy in, in its alt authoritarian model, and Russia's outright attacks on liberal democracy that we've witnessed in recent years. I wonder if you could comment on those outside forces uh, alongside the internal forces that you spoke of today. Thank you. Thank you. Let's take one or two more. Uh, back there and then up front here. Hi, I'm an independent uh, scholar. I have a question regarding rise of authoritarianism, populism. Lately, I've been reading about uh, Adolf Hitler's rise in power in Germany in the 1930s. Uh, he advocated practice uh, master race, Aryan race, Final solution, concentration camp, extermination, SS, Gestapo, Third Reich, etc., uh, which resulted in 6 million Jews' deaths. Uh, Auschwitz alone, 1 million, which means uh, 10 times Hirosh Hiroshima deaths. And approximately, if I uh, remember correctly, 40 million deaths in Europe. Europe. Now, my question today is um, this kind of thing going to happen uh, in the future because of the uh, rise of authoritarianism, populism? Thank you. Thank you. And then take one more, and then we'll go to the speakers. Yes, uh, thank you for your remarks. Um, two points, two questions. So first, yes, um, I'm an advisor based in New York, focused on sustainable development goals, uh, 2030 targets at the local level. So the first point is on reversing the uh, polarization of politics, that given that lately much of, specifically for the U.S., the gridlock has been seeing on the national level, as in each party trying to push a nationalized agenda, what uh, promise uh, do you see in this recent, especially in the recent uh, spate of special elections, refocusing on issues of local concern as a way to realign politics from identity towards goals, and secondly, about uh, this issue of uh, immigration, that here, if you again, if you take the example of Canada, that do you see much, in Canada, they were actually known for one of the only working models of uh, immigration policy, in which the goal is to, was to assimilate as opposed to just bring them in as guest workers. So, do you think uh, potentially a more robust approach to assimilation could alleviate some of the pitfalls regarding immigration? Okay, well, why don't we, we choo please choose to respond to whichever of those you would like. Uh, yes, and because we have eight minutes left, I will be briefer than the questions deserve. <laughs> Uh, I have no choice. Uh, first of all, with regard to championing liberal institutions, liberal restraints, I plead not guilty to the charge of ignoring them. You know, I've focused on them throughout my entire scholarly career. I do think they are of independent value because rights are of independent value and the prevention of tyranny is of independent value. And those are the two major functions of the restraints that we're all talking about. Checks and the entire US Constitution, the structure is driven by a dominant overriding goal, the prevention of tyranny. Everything else is gravy. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you know, a and we sacrifice a lot of efficiency, a lot of unity, a lot of a lot of things in the name of preventing you know, what James Madison defined as tyranny, namely the concentration of all powers, executive, legislative, and judicial in a single pair of hands. Uh, so, China. Uh, 
I described populism as the enemy within. I think it would be fair to describe China right now as the enemy without, you know, in part because its policy objectives aim to displace us. Uh, and even more important, because China is developing its own form of soft power, prosperity without liberty. There are a number of quarters of the world where that is a pretty seductive combination. Uh, contemporary populism leading to Hitlerism, I don't think so. Uh, that was then, this is now. Uh, the dangers that we face now, I think, are not of that order, which is not to say that they're trivially, trivial either practically or uh, morally. Uh, very interesting question about federalism, you know, the uses of federalism as mechanisms of depolarization. Uh, there's something to that, and a very intelligent, conservative intellectual, Yuval Levin, you know, wrote an important book e exactly to that effect, and I commend that book uh, to, your, to your attention. That is a, an inherently limited strategy, however, because there's some issues that constitutionally and practically can only be dealt with at the national level. And the issue we've been debating on immigration is a classic example. We can't have 50 states with 50 different immigration policies for a bunch of obvious reasons. This is an issue that has always been a national issue and will continue to be a national issue. And if we can't, as a nation, get our arms around it and resolve our differences as we have in times past, we're going to continue to have, have these, these, these problems. Uh, and finally, you know, immigration, immigration and assimilation. Uh, Nothing irritates native-born Americans more than substantial and continuing agglomerations of people into communities that do not speak English and don't try to attain English language competence. We can have a long debate about the statistics here, but we are in a different situation. This is the first time in probably since the mid-18th century when a majority of immigrants overall were drawn from a single linguistic community that wasn't English speaking. And this has generated some real problems. Uh, most Americans intensely dislike picking up the phone, you know, getting an automatic, you know, response, press one for English, press two for Spanish. Uh, because that stands for a kind of enduring linguistic division which you know, which means trouble, as it has in Belgium and Canada and many other countries. That was my four minutes. Yasha, over to you. <laughs> All right. Um, so uh, I agree with the importance of checks and balances and the importance of controls. I, I think it's wrong for you to think that we're just defending those. The unique thing that liberal democracy has always promised is that we get to do two things at the same time. We get to have individual liberty, we get to determine how we lead our own lives, but we also get collective self-determination. We actually can politically be effective, and when we want some form of political change, we have a decent chance of making it work. That's the difficult thing to sustain, because once a majority is willing, for example, to restrict the rights of a minority, there's no way of squaring the circle. There's no magical set of institutions that over time is going to save us from those uh, repressive instincts. So we have to fight the battle every day anew and convince people to preserve those two things. But I think it's absolutely a matter of standing on both. If we can have a system in which we don't have tyranny and we have some amount of freedom from the government as individuals, but the government is no longer responsive to what people actually want, we've given up half of what our political system actually promises us in a way that is deeply problematic. That speaks a little bit to the larger ideological fight that's going on. I think um, you know, thankfully, China is a very effective country in practice, but an absolute mess in theory. <laughs> Which is to say that unless you have China's particular history and the particular institution of uh, a, a, a pretty state capitalist, supposedly communist party in charge, it's very difficult to emulate China. So I think the threat now is twofold. The threat, first of all, is the deep divisions in our own countries that make it so easy for countries like Russia to have an influence on our elections. 
to try and divide us from each other. And secondly, it is the rise of an alternative regime form, which is not straightforwardly authoritarian, but that builds itself as a liberal or authoritarian democracy. And that, to me, is much more frightening than the ideological alternative that China supposedly offers. Um, the, the comparison, I mean, obviously, you know, uh, as soon as you start mentioning Hitler, you've lost the debate, but um, uh, as is well known. But, but I actually think there's good reasons to avoid that comparison. Um, not just because I think on the merits it's wrong and we're not anywhere close to descending in the Third Reich today in the United States and anybody who suggests that I think is being a little silly, um, but also because what is often meant to be a sort of sobering alarmist thought actually has the opposite effect. Because if you m imagine the downfall of democracy as only happening in circumstances where people walk around performing the Hitler salute, um, you know, in big shiny black boots running around with torches through the middle of the street, you're going to look out of a window and say, this ain't happening. So what are people worried about? But as anybody who's actually studied how democracies have perished over time knows, the example of the failure of the Weimar Republic is a, is a very unusual example. In a lot of democracies, those systems have failed because somebody has said, I'm going to be more democratic. I'm the true representative of the people. Just give me a bit more power. Just trust me. I'm going to make everything better. And that, I think, is a far more scary thought for what might happen. Now, let me conclude on something slightly optimistic. Because events uh, like these, I think, can be, uh, shall we say, a little depressing. <laughs> and I do think that the danger is very real. I mean, my book is called Why Our Freedom is in Danger and How to Save It. And I think our freedom is in danger. That's not hyperbole. But there's something happening here, which is that unlike the citizens of China and of Russia and of Venezuela, we still have the power to fight for our own values. And I don't think I can promise you a happy end, but I also don't know that it's going to be a tragic end. It depends on what we do. I went to a great talk by Amos Oz a number of months ago, and he said, there's a big fire burning, and we each of us only have a little glass of water in front of us. And if each of us goes and puts the water on that fire, I alone can't do very much. But there's a bunch of us sitting in this room and there's a bunch of people watching this, and if all of us take that glass of water and try to put it on the fire, then together we might just be able to put it out. And I think it's our duty as people who do believe in liberal democracy, who do believe that we both want individual rights and collective self-rule, to go and try to do that. Well, thank you for uh, concluding on an uplifting note. Uh, thanks to you both, really uh, superb presentation. Please join me in thanking you. And now books will be available for sale in the back of the room. Thank you all for coming. And we're happy to sign them. You have time to sign them? Yeah. Why not? They're offering to sign them, too. All right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> to Kathy with a K. Uh, I don't know how long they're available, but I think for a time at least they are. You should ask the CSAN people. <laughs> Thank you. Take care.